All right, um, just because I think everyone sat for a little bit too long, I, I need to do some quick research here for this sermon. So I need everyone to stand up. All right. Don't worry. Most of you won't be standing for long. All right. So first off, anybody that was on vacation this past week, you're going to probably already know my sermon. You're good. Sit down. Anybody was on vacation? Nope. Okay. How about anybody that worked between zero and 20 hours, our part-timers? Anybody? Everybody here? Sit down. When I, when, I, when, I, when I get to your number, please sit down. That's how I'm going to know that I've hit it. Okay. What about uh, 20 to 40 hours this week for your full-time people? Yeah, there's our full-time people. All right. <laughs> now let's see. What about um, what, what, 40 to 60? Who works like a Victorian with no labor laws? <laughs> All right. And now I know who I'm preaching to who works 60 plus hours a week, I guess. <laughs> what? Or retired. Well, I'm also going to put out that, you know, a lot of you moms sat down way too early because, you know, like average, uh, the, the, on a survey, when they are asked to parcel out their hours, they work like 97 hours a week. So everyone else can please sit down. That's fine. Thank you very much for helping. Um, so I guess the point is, is that for the majority, like almost nobody sat down for part time. Nobody was on vacation this week. So... Um, now, if I did the same thing, but asked, how long did you rest this week? <laughs> I think everyone would sit down pretty darn quick. Um, and, you know, I'm a part of this. I'm part of this culture. You know, like, I, you know, I worked 60 hours, 60 plus hours this past week as well with everybody else. But, um, you know, but we need to make sure that we're, you know, resting, and I mean, like, I'm from a long line of of, of uh, workaholics. So, I mean, anyone else that they when they when they watch their dad rest, but it looked like, like this was mine. They got the clicker. Something's on. Don't touch the clicker though, because he knows what's on. He's just asleep. <laughs> well, I mean. Mine's updated now. I, I'm just mm, zoning. Nothing. <laughs> nothing on my brain. Nothing going on. Now, do you think that that's <laughs> biblical rest? <laughs> um, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's addressed in the Bible, <laughs> but I think that we're all, you know, like, we, we, we'd find it in places like Elijah. <laughs> um, so Elijah had, has just come off a great week. He ended a drought. He called fire down from heaven. And he was hoping that it would convince one of his best friends, the king, to, you know, get rid of his wife and come back to God. And then he gets a note from her that says, I'm, I'm going to kill you. And, he go, and so he worked so hard to just be so discouraged right at the end of it. You know, like, how many people haven't felt with he, like he did in First Kings? But he himself went a day journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested of himself that he might die, and said, It is enough, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father. It's one of the oldest prayers that we have, I mean, we have the Lord's Prayer, but it's, um, it's a Kyrie eleison. Any biblical scholars in here? Anyone knows what that means? What that means? The Latin there. Anybody? No, okay, maybe I'm just not hearing it over the... <laughs> but it means, Lord, have mercy. 
Um, now, somebody on the internet put it through a translator that didn't have context or anything, and it came out with, Sir, take it easy. Um, and how, you know, sometimes when we are working that hard and we haven't had that chance to, re to rest, when we are as burnt out as Elijah was, we just need to pray that, <laughs> you know, like, you know, you, 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 we pray, Lord, have mercy on it. You know, but, you know, think about, like, the psalm that we just wrote. <laughs> like, that's somebody that, is going through the darkest part of their life and still praising God. And so, you know, that's the theme of the song. It's just, you know, sir, <laughs> take it easy, please. <laughs> Lord, take it easy on me. Um, you know, like we, and, you know, if you find yourself in that mode today, like we've had a lot of people that are, they haven't had that rest. They're looking for that rest. Know you're in good company because, I mean, like, We've got, um, you know, if we read in Matthew, he went a little further and on his and fell on his face and prayed, saying, "Oh Father, if it if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but Thou wilt." And then a little further on, he went away again a second time and prayed, "Oh Father, if." If this cup may not pass away from me, expect I drink it, thy will be done. That's Jesus. That's God on earth. That's God on earth pushed. He's going to be pushed through the hardest thing he's had to go through. What he came here to do. And he's saying, please don't make me. I need rest. I need your rest, you know, and God sees that, because like, if we go back to Elijah, um, under that juniper tree back in 1 Kings, we read, as he lay there and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because your journey is too, is too great for thee. He arose and did eat and drink, and went in strength of that meat for forty days and forty nights unto Horeb and the Mount of God. So God is here and he hears you when, if you're in that place today. That if you are, if you need that rest that he's offering, if you need, if you're just tired, I just need the sleep that no amount of sleep is going to give me. God is here. God, God is willing to meet you there. And like give you that, that food, that spiritual food that you need and to do that. You know, and it's important that, you know, even if you aren't there, like, God's rest is different than that. We're not, God never means us to just collapse. <laughs> you know, that's not what weary and well-doing, that's not what any of that is. Um, so we actually have one of God's work weeks in the Bible, so we can go through that um, in Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. And it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was the evening, the morning, the first day. So you see, creates. And then the day ends. Now this next one I find interesting because it proves that, that God can be a little bit more like all of us sometimes. And God said, let the firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament divide among the waters, which were under the firmament, which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning the second day. One thing I never noticed before, where does he say it was good? 
Has anyone ever been part of that project where like you hit the priming stage of painting where it doesn't look great yet? And you're like, well, why did I even start this project? I think that's where God was on the second day. <laughs> but anyway, that's some spiritual imagination. Don't base any scripture off that. But <laughs> I just thought it was really funny. Because I purposefully, like, I went for King James Version. Because, like, this is, this is the basic Bible. This is as, you know, authoritative as we can get. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not. This is not, you know, leftist propaganda telling you you need to to rest more, like, no, this is, this is Bible. You know, the fourth day, and then God set forth grass upon an herb yielding seed, fruit trees yielding fruit of its kind, whose seed is it, is in it of itself, upon the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after its kind, and tree yielding fruit, and those seed was in itself and after its kind. God saw that it was good, in the evening and the morning of the third day. And then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He then made the stars also. God set them upon in the firmament of heaven and gave them the, to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and the night and divide the darkness from the light. And God saw that it was good. And God created the whales and every living creature that moveth the waters and brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God made the beasts of the earth after its kind, the cattle after their kind, everything that creepeth upon the earth. And God saw that it was good. And he created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the living things on the earth. God saw the thing that he had made. Behold, it was very good. Evening in the morning, the sixth day. So, and then in the next chapter we start with, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. He had made, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from his work in, that God had created and made. So, now, this is a, you know, God rested on that day. We know what happens in the next, in this same chapter where he rested, saying that it's good, it's done. Within, uh, we don't have an exact amount of time, but Adam only lived to 500. Within 500 years, sin had entered the world and it was all messed up. You know, you don't think that God could have been like, maybe I put more warning lights around the, the tree, or maybe like, Maybe I don't make the stars so predictable that people get lost in astrology or, you know, think that they're, you know, something like that. Or maybe I don't make poisonous animals that can bite us or like things that will kill us, or, you know. But he didn't. He said at the end of his work, that was good. It is finished. And I, he didn't tweak it anymore. He didn't, it wasn't, he wasn't trying to, to make, make it better. He did his work and then was done. Now, I get it today, you know, everything's more expensive and nothing, no one's getting paid more, you know. But my, uh, my, my, grandfa my, my wife's grandfather um, was a workaholic too, but... He had his own little laws from Leviticus where he would say on Sunday, it's the Lord's day. And he would say that all the time, not as a reminder to us, but as a reminder to him. Because there's always something more that we can tweak. I don't care, you know, you're always going to be thinking about, well, I should have done this, or I've got to get this ready for next week, or, you know. And God gave us this day that we can all come together. God gave us the Sabbath. And 
you know, if we read on in Leviticus, there's so many laws about the Sabbath that Jesus has to come back and go, come, when Jesus comes, he has to say, all right, guys, cool it. <laughs> like, you know, because that was how important rest was. And I know that we all don't have the opportunity, you know, I know, like, I'm not up here like my therapist was when I went and told him, well, I'm overworked. He's like, well, you got to stop something. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll stop eating. Thanks. <laughs> like, you know, like, I get it that we're all busy and that, you know, sometimes your know, prayer group can feel like a step too far. You know, for us, sometimes that happens because we, 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 there's travel, there, I have to get out of work, you know, Amanda has to get out of work. It can, but some of the most rested I've ever felt was after coming out of prayer group, after spending time in his presence. Sometimes on Sunday morning, you know, because I have defended that day, and it's a day I, I, I tell every, every employer that I have, I don't work then. But some days, like, <laughs> I'd rather just sleep. I'd rather be the Elijah, just getting under my juniper tree and just <laughs> nap. But... That's not the rest I need. This is the rest I need. This is the rest to be able to come here and rest in the Lord and to enjoy the Spirit. You know, I lived this like last week. You know, I've had, you know, pretty terrible, you know, work, you know, 60 plus hours, Saturdays, six days a week for the past two weeks. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, my daughter was in the hospital three weeks ago, and, you know, my father-in-law is in the hospital now. You know, so it's just been kind of crazy. And you know, last week when I came to service and we were just singing and it just, it was just the rest I needed so that I was able to, to enter the next week. It wasn't any easier. Well, didn't, the work didn't get easier. The, the hours didn't get easier. But my spirit was rested. And so that that's what I'm hoping for everyone here. Is that, you know, if if you if you need the if you need the the crash and the cake, I hope that's here for you. If you need if you just need that refreshing, I I know you can find it here. Praise you, God. Well that's the key to uh what we uh, learned about in uh the earlier sermon about that rest. Is surrendering all to him, let him have the worries, let him take the responsibilities. Let him have control and just do what he asks us to do. Praise God. I'm going to speak to you now about our partnership in the gospel. In Philippians, uh, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and he was thankful. He rejoiced because of their partnership in the gospel. He said, from the first day that you heard about it until now. And... Um, um, I first learned that the word was uh, fellowship, and uh, fellowship has a positive uh, uh, meaning in my mind. When I was a kid, we used to go to fellowship meetings, and there were meetings that we'd have like once every month, and they'd be uh, meetings at other churches, and so we'd travel quite a ways because we lived in uh, a, a district uh, that had some big states. We had Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. And so when we would make a trip for a fellowship meeting, it meant a good good half day's drive sometimes or a good part of a day's drive uh, in order to get there just for the meeting. We'd get there for the meeting, and as I remember, we had a, uh, a service uh, toward the beginning uh, right after we got there. And then we would have a, a, a communal dinner, and I don't remember exactly how it was. I was, you know, like second, third, fourth grade, so that wasn't one of my responsibilities. I was just there and... I was there to eat it when it was time to eat and uh, go play when it was time to play. And then we had another service again. And uh, uh, then it was the long drive home. And um, uh, my brothers and I, we would be sleeping in the back seat of the car while uh, my dad drove home. And we'd be back in uh, time to get some sleep before we went to church uh, the next morning. It was Sunday morning. And uh, that was my idea of a fellowship meeting. It's very positive, uh, communal. Uh, social uh, environment. And uh, so there are certain things I, I connect with that idea of fellowship. One is hearing the preaching of the word. Another is singing together and praying together. And uh, then another is uh, that social time of uh, eating together and getting to uh, 
uh, reconnect with people that you haven't known with known for a long time. Uh, other preachers in the district, uh, you know, asking how old you are and what grade you're in now, and those kind of questions that uh, you uh, just grow up uh, answering. And uh, so that's uh, that's my idea of uh, fellowship. Um, this word for partnership is a word koinonia, which if you're from here in Thompson, you might uh, know that as a place called the Koinonia School of Sports, which is over on, uh, I think it's Route 21. And uh, it's been around, I guess this year is their 50-year anniversary since they started the Koinonia School of Sports. And the idea is it's a place for uh, physical activity for families and individuals to go and enjoy and uh, stay in shape and uh, uh, be, um, uh, I guess, progress in that way as as families. Uh, now, they, uh, on their website, they describe koinonia as friendship. And I can see how they, they would understand that and how that connection could come in there with that uh, based on my sense of uh, fellowship, which uh, koinonia is the Greek word for, uh, for this idea of uh, fellowship. I remember years ago, um, a guy talking about um, uh, the word koinonia and fellowship and he was, uh, he was pointing out that a lot of times in church situations, the idea of fellowship can be just kind of reduced down to having coffee and donuts together, or chip and dips like we did yesterday. Uh, but um, it's a little bit more than that. And once I learned that this idea of partnership and working together becomes a part of it, it kind of expanded my mind to think about the possibilities for what it means to have this partnership in the gospel. We, um, we think of uh, partners in terms of business partners, and it's when uh, two or more people come together and uh, they want to uh, uh, create some kind of a, a business and they want to make a profit at it, at least they want to make a living and uh, they want to build that up and they want to make that work together and so everybody puts together their resources and um, make it work. And... Um, that, I think, kind of really uh, helps me better understand what we're talking about when we're talking about this koinonia, this uh, fellowship that we have uh, in the uh, church of the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. There's something about being part of something else that it helps us uh, to see uh, more things done. It helps us see things done that we couldn't have done just by ourselves. Some people are really good, and some people can get a lot of things done by themselves. And uh, a lot of people, um, it kind of helps us if we tag along with someone else and um, help them do as well as they can. As a matter of fact, a lot of ministers uh, would recommend for uh, young men and women who are seeking to enter into ministry that you do just that, that you become a part of someone else's ministry and do what you can to make them successful and you will learn through the process things that will help to make you successful in your future ministry. So there's something that um, we, can, we can vicariously experience something by joining together with someone else. Jesus said, if anybody welcomes you, he welcomes me. That's a pretty powerful statement, huh? That's a lot of faith about what he had planned for us that he would do in our lives. That he would change us so much that people would um, be welcoming him by welcoming us. And it's like sometimes we don't realize what God has done for us after he's done something for us. We don't realize the extent to uh, what it is uh, that, that he's done something and he's, he's done powerful changes in our lives and yet other people do notice these things. And they're able to give God glory for this in, uh, in, in their ways. And so there's a welcoming that uh, comes when people bring us into their lives that they're actually bringing the Lord Jesus Christ into their lives. He went on to say, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Well, that's a pretty powerful statement. <laughs> All you have to do is you have to welcome the prophet and think of him as a prophet, not just, uh, you know, uh, something else that uh, you might think of 
him or her because of uh, uh, whatever mindset you have. But you say, you're, you're welcome to be part of our, our ministry. You're welcome to be part of our church. You're welcome to be part of my life. And you're welcomed. And that prophet's going to receive a, a reward for what he has done or uh, what she has done. And then you're going to uh, partake in that reward when that reward is uh, given out because the Lord recognizes that that way in which we become a part of what someone else has done. He said that if you, um, if you welcome a righteous man based on his righteousness, that you will receive that righteous man's reward. You'll participate in that righteous man's reward. This really became uh, clear to me um, when I was reading one of the epistles that the Apostle John wrote. He wrote three epistles, and the third one, uh, there are three men who are addressed by name. One of this is uh, Gaius. Uh, another one is uh, uh, Diotrephes, and the other one is Demetrius. And he has something to say about each one of those men. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. He gets at a certain point, and he, he tells Gaius, who Gaius is the recipient of the uh, letter, he tells him, he says, uh, imitate the good stuff. Don't imitate the bad stuff. The one who uh, does good things is blessed by God, okay, and, the, and has seen God. And uh, so he's um, addressing uh, Gaius, and he, ad he opens up himself. He doesn't even give his name. Now, we know him as uh, John the Beloved from the gospel that he wrote. He refers himself as to the disciple whom Jesus loved. But here, things have changed. During the gospel times, when he was with Jesus, he is uh, considered to have been the youngest of the apostles. But now, he's like... At this point of writing this, he's probably one of the few remaining, if there are any others remaining. And so he describes himself as the elder, simply the elder. And that's the way they started off with letters in those days. They start off by giving the name of the person who was uh, writing the letter, and then they tell to whom it was written. And so he starts off by saying, the elder. And so we'll call him, uh, we'll call him John the Elder. And he addresses uh, Gaius as Gaius the Beloved. He said, you're the Beloved whom I have loved in the truth. It's a real echo of uh, how John thought himself in light of Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved. And uh, this seems to have been a disciple of his. He, he describes him as his own child. And... Uh, and that's how he addresses him. And he not only addresses him right in the opening statement as the beloved, but there are three other, uh, more times in this short, um, uh, short one chapter uh, of the Bible uh, letter. He describes him as uh, beloved three times. So he opens up his, um, his letter. He says, uh, I pray for you. I pray for you. I pray for your success and for your health. And he prays that he would have his health, and his uh, success, his prosperity, and his health be in the same proportion to the way that his soul is prospering and being healthy. I read about a guy once who, um, he started uh, including that little opening in letters that he would write to his friends. I pray that you would prosper and that you should be healthful as your soul is prospering. And then he started thinking about that. He said, wait, who am I writing to? Some of these friends I have, I wouldn't say that their souls are prospering. And so if I'm asking for their health to be in proportion to, if their physical health to be in proportion to their, uh, to their spiritual health, maybe I'm not really praying the best thing for them, huh? <laughs> it might sound more like a curse if you really think about it, you know I hope you're, hope you're as bad off as you are in spirit. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that's what John was intending here. And so what he was really thinking was he had a really high opinion of uh, this uh, man, Gaius. And uh, he was, he was uh, praying the best for him. 
He goes on to say, and to prove that this is, that was what he really meant, he goes on to say that how great a joy he had when some of the brothers came along, they'd been passing through, and appearance, it appears that they were itinerant preachers uh, going about from place to place and ministering. And they got to John, and they told him about how this Gaius had just great faith, and uh, he was a really a lover of the truth. And, he, uh, and so John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Years ago, um, my mom gave me this little uh, letter opener thing. She'd actually gotten it from, you know, some business, I don't know, bank or uh, life insurance or something. And so it had their name in a little thing. You know, it's a little advertising thing. Uh, but it worked out really well, and I still have it. It has a little, little pointy thing that you poke in between, you know, at the top of the letter, and you just start sliding it, and then there's this razor blade that cuts into it and it just makes a nice cut along it. Well, finally, I, I decided I got something better I can put in that. So I slipped out the, the little advertisement uh, part of it, and I slipped in this uh, verse. Um, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And if you're here as a parent, I'm sure that that's the same, the same feeling you have in your hearts, that you want to know that your children are walking in truth. So we hung that up, and it's still hanging up on our refrigerator. Because it's still true. And this is the way that um, John the Elder felt about this uh, younger man, Gaius, and his work that he was doing. He went on to say, he said, um, he said, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. Not everybody can say whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. Whatever you're doing is going beyond the scope of our knowledge about what somebody is doing. But he had that trust that whatever he was doing, that it was for the benefit of the kingdom. It was for the benefit of the Lord's work. And that he could trust him just to say, go ahead and do whatever you're doing for the brothers and the sisters. Even these who were strangers to you. I remember um, uh, many, many uh, years uh, throughout my life, we would have an occasional visit from a, uh, a minister, maybe a missionary, maybe an evangelist. And we had no idea anything about them before they came, except that, you know, we, we just had, you know, a good report from others that they were uh, part of the same uh, fellowship group, and, and it was, you, you, you trust them on that basis. So they came as strangers, and yet you accepted them, you, you welcomed them, you greeted them, and you found out that you were of the same uh, like precious faith, and uh, you could accept their ministry. And so that's what was happening here is that Gaius did not know these people uh, before they, they came to his town and uh, to his church, but he accepted them in. And when he did that, that was something that uh, these people were impressed by because not everybody received the itinerant preachers uh, into their uh, personal spheres. So, so these were even strangers, and they told about... Uh, they told the church about your love. He said, so please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. In other words, don't just say, yeah, you know, go down the road, but help them because they're going to have some, some expenses that they are going to have to cover as they uh, continue on their traveling, uh, you know, food, lodging. And um, uh, he wanted those things to be taken care of. So he... Uh, he went on to say that, he said, um, they did this, what they have done, this preaching that they have done, this ministering that they have done, they've done it on behalf of the name. And the name here is referring to the name of Jesus. They did it for Jesus' namesake. That's why they, they ministered. That's why they reached out. And so they're doing it for a good cause. And uh, they they didn't receive any 
thing from everybody else. There's no, uh, you know, government uh, help the uh, missionaries uh, group out there helping them. They're doing this for the name of Jesus. So they will be needing people like you uh, to help them to uh, spread the gospel. And he went, and then, and then this comes to um, what has really uh, struck me in this uh, passage. He says, and we ought, we ought to support such people like this. Um, so that we can become partners and fellow workers in the truth with them. Well, that's the good example. The good example is that we support someone's ministry and we become uh, partners with them in that ministry. Then he goes on to the bad example. There was a guy named Diotrephes. Now, Diotrephes is like, well, let's put it this way. Over here on this end of the spectrum, we have Gaius. And over on this end, we have Diotrephes. And they both had something that they loved. Gaius loved the truth. And John praised him for that. But Diotrephes didn't have that same love for the truth. He did have a love. You probably know the um, the uh, uh, a Greek word for love, which is uh, philos. Okay, so we know words in English that are based on this, like uh, someone who loves loves uh, wisdom is called a philosopher. Uh, someone who loves books is a bibliophile. Um, so there are a lot of words that uh, have moved into English by using that word philos. And it has to do with the, uh, the type of love that friends have for one another. Well, the type of love that Diotrephes had was uh, a philoprotuon. Now that word proto, that's kind of like the word we use in prototype. Okay, a prototype is like the original type that you base the, uh, your future products on. You, you create a prototype and then you develop everything out, you, you tweak that and then and then you uh, build everything else. So, so he had a love to be first. Not a love to put the Lord Jesus Christ first. Not a love for the truth, but the love to be first. <clears throat> and one of the ways that he is a little bit different from, um, you know, like, well, like really different from Gaius, Gaius is willing to accept strangers and uh, take them into his house and into his church. Theotrephes does not even welcome the Apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved. He's, he does not even welcome him into uh, the church. And um, uh, John the Elder, he told uh, Gaius, he said, you know, when I come, I'm going to have to uh, address this issue with him. He said he just speaks nonsense about us with evil words. And he doesn't welcome the visiting brothers. Like, you're supporting them. I advise you to support them. And he throws out of the church those who do support them, and, uh, or, or at least who wish to. So this is a guy, I mean, he's really, uh, uh, he's got a different type of uh, a ministry, you might say. Okay. Um, it kind of reminds you of what um, the... Um, uh, Jude, the brother of the Lord, wrote a book to a group of people, and he talked about this people with this type of mindset, how that they love to go to these feasts that Christians would have together, and they're just kind of making sure that they got, you know, the first uh, first servings and first helpings and everything that they wanted. You know, they they looked out for themselves first. And this is what Diotrephes is doing. So it's at this point that uh, John the Elder says to Gaius, he said, don't imitate the bad. Imitate the good. The good is what comes from God. And then there's another fellow, and this may be the one who was actually carrying the letter to Gaius, and this is Demetrius. And he talks about everybody speaks well about Demetrius. So so he's the one who's bringing you this letter, so just accept him. <clears throat> Several years ago, 
some of you may know uh, Brother Jonathan Rabitas, and this was when he was a uh, young man, teenager. He was expressing his call to the ministry, and Brother Hansen was uh, uh, honoring that call and uh, trying to support that call and help that call develop into a mature ministry. And so Brother Hansen designed a, uh, a growth plan for uh, Brother Rabitas as a young minister. And uh, this is the plan that uh, they had. Uh, Brother Rabitas was going to be working for the church under the direction of Brother Hansen for 40 hours and uh, working as something like minimum wage or something like that. And the church was going to fund the cost of hiring him to work for 40 hours a week for a full year. And so in order to do that, we took up an offering. And um, it was kind of an offering similar to the one that we did recently that um, has provided the way for the brother and sister Hansen to be in Israel right now or on their way there if they're not exactly there today. Um, they're getting close. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's what we did. So there was, um, there was a, a fundraising thing. And I, by fundraising, I mean, um, like, you know, pray about this and uh, let us know what you would like to uh, give to that. And a certain amount of money was uh, designated to figure out that we would uh, need to have to be able to uh, fund him being able to do that. And the money was raised. And so we became partners in his training. And we became partners in his ministry. And... We have heard reports. He went out on the evangelistic field and he ministered for, um, I don't know if you'd say months, but at least uh, many weeks in Australia. Uh, I think he went to Ethiopia and uh, became part of um, someone else's ministry there and he, he uh, benefited by that. And he ministered throughout the United States going from church to church. And I'm not saying that we supported every single move that he made, but we were partnering with him in his development and his, his you know, part of, um, I, I want to say that he may have been like part of his uh, duty was to preach once a week. And uh, he'd be teaching so many Bible studies and he'd be doing just different things around here. And he was, uh, you know, Brother Hanson was basically his, uh, his boss for that year. And... Um, it really made a difference in his, in his life. So we were a part of when um, not only those evangelistic um, uh, opportunities that he took advantage of, and he saw great and wonderful miracles take place, and many people saved, but as he started to um, come back here under the Lord's direction and uh, to start a church of his own, and then he relocated, he, and now he's uh, in Worcester, and uh, several of you have been to uh, uh, the place where they... Uh, hold services there up in Worcester, and um, God's doing a work in there. He's opening doors now for them to uh, uh, minister in Boston, and um, so they have uh, two things going, and you know what? We're a part of him, not just because, not just because this is where he got the Holy Ghost, not just because this is where he went to Sunday school when he was a kid, but it's because we actually supported him financially and helped him to get to be uh, the place where he is. And that's not taken away from anything that he has done because, you know, he's the one who's had to go through the ringer to be where he is. But uh, it does speak to the power of a partnership. By supporting his developing ministry, we became partners with him in the truth, and we, we can rejoice in that. And, you know, it sounds like from what the scripture we read earlier that we might have a little bit of the reward with uh, Brother Jonathan, and we just... I think it's just enough to, you know, rejoice and hear the good reports and uh, be thankful for God, to God, what he has done. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, for years I heard, um, uh, we, not I heard, but uh, we, we had services with uh, missionaries. And let me explain one reason why we don't have missionaries uh, visiting so much anymore is because people have seen the need that, if if a, if, a, if a minister wants to go to another country and be a missionary there for four years, they got to have a budget. And uh, what we <clears throat> what we do is that we expect them to raise their budget 
to go uh, to 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 speak to people, to get them to to buy into their burden and to um, to believe in uh, what God wants to do and it's possible, and to partially fund them. And um, th there came a point a few years ago where it was the the Lord laid a burden on uh, some people here in the United States. It's like, you know, if we could. Instead of a missionary taking uh, nine, ten months a year of just going around and ministering in the U.S. to raise a budget, if we could get that budget to them, like as soon as they finish up a four-year term, have the money ready for them to go on to another four-year term, then they could continue working in the country of their calling rather than coming back and ministering in the United States for a year. Uh, because, you know, it, it really... It's really nice to see continuity. Um, you see this in your job. You see this in your education. That a continuity really is a good thing in the long run. Taking big, long breaks. Uh, um, a lot of people feel like uh, summer vacation, as much as we might love our summer vacations in schools, some people feel like you know, it's, it's like there's too much of a loss of learning that takes place, too much forgetting that go, uh, and it's like you have to, restart up again when you get back in August and September and, and it's like it's it's too much time lost. Well, I think the same thing works with um, someone being on site at their place of ministry. And so that's why we don't see um, uh, uh, missionaries quite as frequently as we used to. <clears throat> it's because they're ministering to where God has called them to. And that's a good thing. Uh, and I don't remember ever hearing a missionary preach about from Third John when they would ask for a support. They usually uh, spoke something which would be more ministering to the needs of the church. But when I came across this, I said, wow, this is exactly what we're doing when we are binding together with missionaries and helping to support them to do their, their job that God has called them to in their, in their place of uh, ministry. This understanding of Scripture was a true understanding. And uh, this developed into um, uh, a program that we have called Partners in Missions. And I said, wow, you know, the, what a well-chosen name. We are partnering together with someone. We're partnering together with them in their ministry. And we're seeing the gospel go forward around the world and reach so many people. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard missionaries say that, you know, we're going to go. If you give, we'll be able to go. And um, they always said, uh, don't just give, you know, pray. Because <laughs> we're, we're depending on your prayers, too, not just on your offerings. Um, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so when, when, I, when I was studying this, uh, this passage, um, a few months ago, it's like, wow, this is just so good. This is so, so good. It's so good for us to be able to see something maybe we've been doing or maybe it's something like, it's like, well, should I do it or maybe I'm not doing it. And um, But here it is. It's in the Word of God. And this is what he wants. Another way that uh, people have um, sponsored uh, ministries uh, is with Bible school school students. And I know there are a lot of people in here who have supported Bible school students in the past, uh, raising something like, you know, not raising, but just giving uh, out of their, not necessarily their abundance, but out of whatever they have to work with, say maybe $500 to support a, a Bible school student. And when we look at uh, our cost of education in the United States and what it will cost for uh, a Bible student to go through a training and to go from being a new convert to becoming a minister in their uh, their country, it's like wow, five hundred dollars. That sounds like that sounds like a good investment, and and it has been. And so, so they're going to be. If if you've been a part of these things, then you know what I'm talking about. And you know what a blessing it is, and how exciting it is to be a part of it. If if you haven't been, well, until the Lord comes. There's going to be a lot more opportunities which he's going to open up for us. And he's going to be bring people your way. He's going to be bring people our way. And you're going to be able to be a part of that. You're going to, um, 
one of the things that um, we do in our, um, well, I'll put it uh, for me in my um, my weekly giving. Well, I, I'll have to say this, my monthly giving, because I, I think about a monthly basis now, but um, uh, two times a month I, I make sure that I have um, offerings that are uh, beyond uh, my regular tithes and offerings. And one of these is our building uh, fund, which uh, helps to take care of making sure that we have a setting here which uh, can be comfortable and um, you know free from the rain and just a place to worship. And we also have a missions fund. Uh, so I, I contribute to each of those uh, every month. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the, the missions uh, fund that goes to take care of missionaries, special speakers, <clears throat> and... So, we can be a part of this. You can be a part of this. So, if you're not a part of this, pray to the Lord and ask how, how we can be a part of it. And uh, if you feel like uh, he's not giving you answers, you can talk to Brother Hanson. And uh, he'll be talking. Um, I'm, I'm sure if you ask him a question, he'll be glad to give you an answer. Uh, like he uh, spoke earlier this year, he said, I, it's been a long time since I've uh, preached a sermon on giving. And so, he, we had a little little session on that. Um, but you can be you can be a big part of this, and if you are, just rejoice in the fact that you are able to be part of what God is doing in the earth, and that you have a reward that's coming because of that part. You say, "Well, it doesn't seem like I'm doing much," and in some people's eyes, maybe you're not. But if you're doing it, Paul said, when you give an offering, the people who who um, uh, gave to him, he said, first of all, they they gave their hearts. And after they gave their hearts, then they poured out of what, what they had. Some of them out of their poverty, some of them out of their wealth. But they all uh, gave freely and what he called a, uh, a cheerful giver. And that is where, that is, that is where, the, uh, where the real flow of that is, is, uh, is coming from. So, God is good. He's good and good today. Um, <clears throat> in case you're thinking I'm going to take up an offering, I'm not going to be taking up an offering. <laughs> and uh, we don't usually take up offerings here. We do have um, uh, baskets that some people take advantage of. A lot of people um, uh, take care of their giving online. And that's um, uh, just part of the uh, way people do things now. And, um, but, but let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord deal with you about how that you can be a part of the ministry that he has. It's bigger than we can do. And we can't, any one of us, uh, do it. And that's why we have this partnership that works, uh, works with this. Praise God.